In this short video, we're going to learn about a special type of subset in Rn, which is called a subspace. So again, a subspace is a subset. It's a collection of vectors, but it's not any collection of vectors. It's a special kind of subset, which has two important properties. The first property is that if you take two vectors in that subset, which we're going to call a subspace now, and add them together, their sum is going to be another vector in that subspace. So you cannot add your way out of the subspace. You also can't scale your way out of the subspace. If you have a vector which belongs to the subspace, and you multiply it by a scalar, uh, then the scaled vector is still in the subspace. So whatever property defines the vectors in W must be preserved under vector addition and scalar multiplication. Let's look at a couple of sets that are not subspaces. So our first set is a very familiar set in R2. It's going to be all the vectors whose sum, whose component sum, is 4. So in other words, x plus y equals 4. If I were to graph that line, we know that it would be a line with the slope negative 1 passing through the y-axis at y equals 4. But is this a subspace? Well, no. You can add your way out of it. Let me show you using an example. If I take two vectors, let's let u be the vector with components 4, 0, and v be the vector with components 0, 4. They're both an s. If I add up the components, they add up to 4. But what if I add u plus v? Well, then I'm going to get a vector with components 4, 4. And 4, 4 is 8. It doesn't belong to the set S. So S cannot be a subspace. Now I can stop here. I've already shown you that it's not a subspace because the subspace has to have both those properties that you can't add your way out and you can't scale your way out. But in this case, this set doesn't have either one of those properties. Uh, so if I look at u, for example, again, u has components 4, 0. And I multiply that times 2, I get a new vector with components 8, 0. And if I add 8 plus 0, I get 8, which of course means that this uh, new vector does not belong to s. So it fails both of the requirements. Let's look at a different set. This is a set U in R3. And the defining property of set U is that at least one of the components should be 0, at least one. So you could have two components, one component, or all three components could be 0. But it's not a subspace because, again, you can add your way out of it. And let's think about this with an example. Let's take the vector a, which has components 0, 9, and negative 3. It belongs to the set u. At least one of the components is 0. And then vector b has components 2, 0, 0. And again, vector b belongs to u, because at least one of the components is 0. But if I add them together, I get the vector with components 2, 9, negative 3. None of those components are 0. So the sum of those two vectors is not in the set u. What's interesting here is that uh, this is a set u. Or the set u does not um, satisfy the condition that you cannot add your way out of it. But it does satisfy the condition that you can't scale your way out of it. If you take a vector that has at least one zero component and multiply it by a scalar, well, any scalar times zero is still going to give you zero. So those zero components are preserved under 
scalar multiplication. So again, just to illustrate that, if I take a vector 0, 5, negative 2, multiply it times any scalar, I'm still going to have a 0 in that first component. But nonetheless, it's not a subspace because the subspace or a subspace has to satisfy both conditions. So again, another way you can think about a subspace is whatever defining property you have for your set, it should be preserved under vector addition and scalar multiplication. We were able to show that uh, some sets are not a subspace by using specific vectors. And, and that's always true. If you want to show that something is false or something uh, is does not have a particular condition, all you need to do is find some uh, specific vectors which demonstrate that it does not have that property. However, to show that a set is a subspace, and we'll see that in a, a, a little bit later on, uh, we're going to have to use generic vectors. We can't just use specific vectors with specific components. And there's only one subspace with a finite number of vectors. So this is going to be a special case. This is called the zero subspace. It's a trivial subspace. It only contains one vector, which is the zero vector. And if it only contains that one zero vector, then um, if you add the zero vector to the zero vector, it's still the zero vector. If you multiply the zero vector times any scalar, you still get the zero vector. So it's a very simple, trivial subspace, and we're going to have to consider it as a special case. So our formal definition is that a non-empty, so we have to have a non-empty, we have to have some vectors, non-empty subspace uh, W contained in Rn, uh, non-empty subset W contained in Rn, is a subspace provided that it's closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. So this is an algebraic term, closed, um, and it means exactly what we were saying before. It's a formal way of saying that if you start with two vectors in W, their sum will be in W. That's closed under vector addition. And that if you start with a vector in W and any scalar, the, if you multiply the vector times that scalar, it's still in W. That's closed under scalar multiplication. Uh, we're going to use the following notation to uh, say that W is a subspace. Uh, and it looks like a subset notation, but instead of having that curved sideways U, you have this sideways triangle. And again, the triangle uh, points to the smaller space, and it opens up to the larger space. All right, so uh, just some terminology and notes about subspaces. Uh, if W is a subspace of V. Uh, we call V the ambient space or the parent space of W. Uh, we may also just say W lives in V. The zero vector has to belong to any subspace. And that should make sense because we said that a subspace has to be closed under scalar multiplication. Well, if I take the scalar 0 and multiply it times any vector, I get the 0 vector. On the other hand, any subspace has to be closed under a vector addition. So first of all, if you have a vector u, then negative 1 times u must also belong to the subspace. That's closure under scalar multiplication. But that means that u and the opposite of u belong to your subspace. And their sum, well, u plus the opposite of u, gives you the zero vector. So both of the closure properties 
tell us that we must have the zero vector in any subspace. Two trivial subspaces of uh, Rn are, well, just the zero vector, so the zero or null subspace that we already talked about. But all of Rn is also a subspace of Rn. And here's the most important idea, or the most important example of a subspace, is if you are given a non-empty subset of vectors, and you form the span of those vectors. Remember, span means all of the vectors that can be generated from linear combinations of those vectors. That itself forms a subspace. That's such an important idea. Why don't we show formally that the span of S is a subspace? So let's start with just some generic non-empty set. So we have m vectors, w1 through wm, in the set S. And we'd like to show that the span of S is a subspace. Well, what do we have to show? We have to show closure under vector addition and closure under scalar multiplication. So let's start with closure under vector addition. Again, what does that mean? It means if I take two vectors which belong to the span of S, I have to show that their sum also belongs to the span of S. So let's think about, well, what is the defining property of span of S? The defining property of span of S is that a vector in the span of S can be generated by a linear combination of W1 through Wm. So, if I start with two vectors in the span of S, then I can find coefficients C1 through Cm and K1 through Km, so that the vector U uses the coefficients C1 through Cm and the vectors in S to be generated as a linear combination. And the K coefficients generate a linear combination of the vectors in S, which equals V. So both U and V are linear combinations of vectors in S. That's what it means to be in the span of S. Well, what about their sum? Well, let's just do some algebra. Let's add these together using the coefficients that we determine. Now we can collect like terms. The vector w1 is multiplied by c1. It's also multiplied by k1. So we could just write that as parentheses c1 plus k1 times the vector w1. And we'll do that with the remaining vectors. So then I would have c in parentheses c2 plus k2 times w2, and so on, all the way up to parentheses cm plus km times wm. Well, look what I have there. What does that form? That forms a linear combination of the vectors in S with coefficients c1 plus k1, c2 plus k2, all the way up to cm plus km, which means that the sum u plus v is also in the span of S. It can also be generated from a linear combination of vectors in S. So we've shown that the span of S is closed under vector addition. But remember, there's two properties we have to show. The second property is that span of S is closed under scalar multiplication. That is, if you take a vector u, we'll use the same u that we used before, and some scalar r, then when I multiply r times u, it should also be in the span of s. Well, let's look at that. If I take u, again, as a linear combination of the vectors in s, that's what it means for u to be in the span of s, and multiply that linear combination by r, I can just use the distributive property. And I could write that as r times c1 plus r times c2, all the way up to r times cm, uh, and multiplied by their respective 
w vectors. And that shows that, wow, I've got another linear combination of the vectors in S. The coefficients now are r times c1, r times c2, all the way up to r times cm. So now I've shown both closure properties, that the span of a set of vectors is closed under vector addition, and it's also closed under scalar multiplication. And since we've shown that the span is closed under both vector addition and scalar multiplication, it is a subspace. So if we think about that, then what are the subspaces of R2? Well, there's only three types of subspaces in R2. You can just have the zero subspace or null subspace, the subspace that contains only one vector, the zero vector. Or you can have any line through the origin. Or you can have the uh, all of R2. So let's think about this in terms of spans. Obviously, the span of the null vector is just the null vector. The span of any non-zero vector is a line through the origin. And the span of two non-parallel vectors in R2 is all of R2. So we've connected span to all of the subspaces in R2. And we can do the same for R3. Again, our trivial, or zero subspace, is the subset that only contains the zero vector. And again, if I take a non-zero vector, its span would be a line through the origin. If I take two non-parallel vectors, their span forms a plane through the origin. And then if I take three non-coplanar vectors, I'll get all of R3. So we're left with the idea that certainly the span of a uh, set of vectors is a subspace. And what we're going to address in the next video is the question of, well, if you're given a subspace, must it be the span of a set of vectors? Certainly, it seems to be true in R2 and R3. Is it true in general? We'll answer that in the next video.